Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Clagg. I'm dean of the school, and I want to welcome you to this dean's lecture. And some of you, this may be the first dean's lecture you've been at, so let me just tell you what they're about. They're about uh, distinguished people from outside the school coming, uh, being invited to give talks, but primarily about uh, recognizing the contributions of people who have been uh, appointed or promoted to the rank of professor at our school. And as I've said many times, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a huge accomplishment to be, to be appointed to our faculty, but to be appointed at the level of professor is really a rare honor. And it's, it's a decision that's made not by me or the chairs or the faculty. It's really made by people from around the world, colleagues who write in, uh, in peer review of the candidate. And so, so it's, a, it's really an honor that we, we affirm, but it's bestowed by, by international experts. And so today, uh, we're here to recognize P.G. Forrest. And P.G. Um, came to us in 2013 the head at that time what was called the Institute of Social Policy, now the Institute of Health and Social Policy. And, and the background uh, is that this was an institute that had existed for a number of years uh, on the Homewood campus that was autonomous and, and reported to the provost. And, and uh, the university asked if we could consider providing a home for the institute, uh, which we did, and, and we're happy to do so because we saw great opportunities for synergies between what the faculty of the institute were, was doing and what our faculty in the Department of Health Policy and Management. So through the efforts of Ellen McKenzie uh, and, and Jane Slagle and others, we created a home here. And, um, and then spent a long time looking for a director because we wanted a director who would be uh, worthy of the work that we knew the institute was capable of. And so we were delighted when we recruited uh, PG. He, he came to us, he was president of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation, which, as many of you know, is a Canadian institution named after a former uh, prime minister that supports policy innovation and the dissemination of actionable research uh, results. Pierre had an academic career at the University of Laval, he, uh, where he started uh, at the lowest rank and rose to the level of professor there. And then in 2002 was appointed the GDW Cameron Visiting Chair with Health Canada, which is uh, essentially the Federal Department of Health in Can Canada. After that, he became the Assistant Deputy Minister and Chief Scientist from 2004 to 2006 with Health Canada, the Federal Department of Health. As the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Minister of Health, PG was accountable for the quality and integrity of the scientific and regulatory research conducted by the department. While doing all these public health or policy practice activities, he, he also was incredibly uh, prolific in terms of his academic output. He's, he's authored more than 150 uh, scientific articles, uh, papers, and books, most notably Changing Healthcare in Canada and Paradigm Freeze. He holds an adjunct professorship with the School of Public Health at the University of Montreal and the National School for Public Administration in Quebec. He was elected to the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences in 2008. And I've only heard him speak publicly once uh, when he came to the, uh, to the HAB, uh, our Health Advisory Board, and spoke. But it was really a visionary talk that riveted the audience. And he, he asked me to keep this short. So he's, uh, but, and, uh, uh, but as we talked about beforehand, there's, it's really much different talking at home among your peers, people you're going to have to see day after day. Uh, it, it, in many ways, is more anxiety provoking. Not that he's anxious. So, uh, so, so, uh, so, so uh, Pierre now directs the Institute for Health and Social Policy, and and in that role is really rebuilding and recreating the institute. Uh, the research it supports expands the understanding of human health and well-being, and generates evidence and insights that inform and influence decision making and policy. It also, and we're very proud of this, houses an internationally recognized Master of Public Policy, which provides students with outstanding analytic skills and creativity to find politically feasible, socially desirable, and economically sustainable solutions to policy challenges. PG trained in political science. He has a master's from Laval and a PhD in history and, and uh, sociopolitics of science from the University of Montreal. He also trained in business, was at the Manchester Business School, and 
and, and after that experience was a consultant the world over for numerous governments and uh, other organizations. So I had the good fortune of being with him and Vicente Navarro, the director of the Barcelona uh, collaboration with UPF uh, in October. And it was really remarkable how many people there in Barcelona knew PG. And it turned out that he had been a consultant for many years to both the university and the government. So we are incredibly uh, happy and, and proud to have PG on our faculty. And uh, please join me in welcoming him to the program. PG Forrest. The three seconds of silence at the beginning of a talk. I, I wrote a poem about this once. Um, <laughs> it's like um, it's like diving into a lake and you don't know how cold the water will be. So um, thank you, Mike. It was a much too long presentation, but um, <laughs> I appreciate. So um, I would like to do uh, just to start something a little unusual. I, I would like to dedicate um, this lecture uh, to the memory of one of my colleagues who passed away last summer, uh, Professor Vincent Lemieux. Um, Vincent was a, um, a colleague of mine for a certain number of years. He was the, you probably don't know his name, but he was the most influential uh, and important particle scientist in Canada in his uh, generation. He wrote more than 30 books. At, when I was his, his colleague at, at Laval, it was stunning. He was actually publishing one book a year. It was absolutely uh, incredible. Um, he's also one of uh, the academic who actually established policy analysis as a discipline in, uh, in, in Canada. We, we did about everything. Uh, you may know that uh, Lemieux is French for the best, and one of my favorite lines in uh, department me departmental meetings was that the best is the enemy of the good. <laughs> um, but he, he, he taught me something very important. Um, Vincent was, was never indifferent to uh, other colleagues' work. And I, I discovered with him that this is a very important, if not the most important dimension of um, academic collegiality. And uh, I'm very grateful for you to be there today because you're basically demonstrating what uh, Vincent was trying to demonstrate uh, uh, during his life, not to be indifferent to other colleagues' um, work. So the policy mind, the policy mind. Um, I came to be, to be convinced, um, as Mike has, has mentioned, I, I spent some, some, something like 13 years in, in public service. And I came to be convinced of the existence of a policy mind. Um, it, it came at, at the end uh, when people were starting to send, and I, I told the story many times, I'm sorry for people, they, they know I'm rambling most of the time. So um, people will, will send me a, an op-ed that has been rejected by a newspaper. Oh, PG, could you explain? It was a very good paper. I put a lot of time. I will look at the op-ed and I will suddenly, I will take 30 seconds, one minute, and say, well, take paragraph two, put it at the beginning, get rid of paragraph four where you're settling your account with your colleagues. Um, had a sentence at the end to say, what could we do now, and send it back. And it will be published, and you will receive more. Or you will receive reports, research reports, written by colleagues. They want the minister to look at it. And you look at the report, and you understand why the, the gatekeepers in the minister's office has, have never transmitted the report to the minister and said the same thing. You know, I look at your executive summary. Cannot you change a few things there? You know, you're talking about things that the other, the other government did. Um, he's not interested in that. He's interested in what he can do now. Just change a few variables, change the story. And I came to understand that this transformation has come, it's, it's not because I was a particularly a brilliant policy analyst or because I was a great operator. It was just because I've changed the way I was seeing problems. And this is what I will try to explain today, what I think is a, a policy mind. I know what it is not. Um, in 1951, Harold Laswell published, which is the, the foundational paper, the, the, the foundational text of 
academic policy analysis. And he was encouraging people to adopt a policy orientation. And in this paper, he was covering things that we still do today, uh, interdisciplinary research. The idea that we should go from practice to, uh, from research to practice. Um, a very problem oriented um, um, uh, kind of take on, 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 uh, on issues. But a policy in mind is more than a policy orientation. It is more in the decades that have followed people, it's, it's 20 years of policy so-called science and people were recommending that we look at every real world problem through a policy framework. A policy mind is more than that. Uh, authors now are more prudent, they are more cautious and they tend to see well, you could have a policy approach and you could have an economic approach or you could have an ethical approach and so on and so forth. Policy mind is more than that. And it's certainly, certainly not a, a political or ideological viewpoint. Uh, one of the most, I, I would say, difficult experience you have when you are in policy making, engage in policy making, is when you're meeting with, you know, so you have an advocate coming to see you and she has a lot of art wrenching stories to tell and very evidently a solution. And she will see you as cold and cynical because you're not reacting like a politician. Your brain is starting immediately to try to imagine what are the solutions. Um, is the definition of the problem right? And this is very different from the way a politician, an active politician will, will react. I was, I was trained, uh, I did my PhD during uh, what is called uh, the cognitive turn, it, it's, it's the second uh, revolution in, in artificial intelligence, so people that, that have come after Minsky, Chomsky, and, and so on and so forth. And it's the time where we have started, in particular in my domain, as Mike mentioned, I've been trained as an historian of science, where we're starting to be very attentive to the fact that science is a very complex cognitive process. Um, and I, I came quite rapidly to the conclusion that policy work is also a complex cognitive process. So how does it work? I think the, the first thing is when you're, you're trained in, in policy, you acquire a kind of repertoire of tools. It could be statistical analysis. It could be constitutional law. Um, it, it, it could be economical uh, uh, and modeling and so on and so forth. You, you also acquire, uh, hopefully, um, some knowledge about the substance of the issues. It is important when you do policy to have some understanding that a particular combination of proteins on the surface of a virus will make a difference. It is important when you do policy analysis to know that if you raise the, the minimal wage, it has more impact on women than on men. It is important to know when you do policy analysis that there is no simple solution to the problem of Jerusalem. I'm sorry for those who believe it's possible. Anyway, the, um, the other thing you learn is, is a mental program um, that will help you retrieve that information and use it. You will know what to do with it. You will know when this is something that needs, for instance, the attention of your minister. When I was active in, in the Department of Health, Canada was, you know, struck by SARS and then by H1N1. And you, 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 I remember a minister telling us one day that he didn't understand where we were talking about dead dogs in Saskatchewan. We're talking about dead dogs in Saskatchewan because we knew it was a, the premise of a real problem of epidemic with H1N1 in Canada. And this was important as a policy analyst to have this substantial capacity to actually put together the tools and the substance of the, of the problem. And so you get instructions about the appropriate use of that information. This is how we train our students. We train our students by getting them, we, we do that all over the world in, in program of public policy. We let them acquire a certain number of tools. We let them acquire a, a substantial understanding of an area of expertise, education, uh, environment, health, and so on. And then we, 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 we create drills for them so that they start understanding how they use those tools when, um, and the information they have acquired to actually address, um, address problem. Is that all? 
no, for sure. And an, an algorithm to access information is never enough. Uh, it's, it's not enough for an accurate diagnosis. It's not enough for policy making. You, the, the, the policy mind um, is not a machine. The, 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 the policy mind is made of this expertise that we, you have acquired during your training, but it, it's also made from this thing that is much more difficult to, to, to define and that we call judgment. The, the capacity, as I have put here, to weave into the decision all sorts of other considerations, considerations that are political, considerations that are ethical, considerations that are um, totally personal to the, to the individuals that are, that are, that are uh, caught in, in this particular situation, and, and uh, consideration that could be about um, the, the aesthetic and, and people that have already dealt with the building of, of, of uh, public uh, uh, institution will know that, that all those aspects have to be part of the way you actually um, uh, use the expertise that you have developed uh, during your, your, your training. So the first answer to the question, what is the policy mind? It is this combination between expertise and judgment. So I know the question you have all on your mind at this time, it is when will this be over? No, it is, uh, what is policy? And I'm not very keen usually to, um, to give definitions at, at the beginning of a, of a talk, but this one is probably my favorite, it is very short. Um, it, for the, the real aficionados, there is 19 syllables. So, you have to get rid of public to get a perfect IQ, but it is an IQ. Uh, public policy is whatever government choose to do or not to do. In fact, if you're, you're trained, you, it's very easy to deconstruct. It's very easy to deconstruct a definition like this one because very evidently, as you know, all uh, policy is not only about government. It's not also a very good definition because policy is much more than about a single choice. It's sometimes it's about not making choice at all. And sometimes it's, it's about the way this particular choice has been implemented, transformed, discussed. So it's not a very good definition. And if you were, if this was a course and you, this were a class, we could play with all the classic definition of, of, uh, of policies and deconstruct them one after uh, the other. So I know what's the second question on your mind. What is policy then? So this is a very famous quote that you probably have seen already many times. It, uh, it's, uh, it comes from the concurrence of, uh, of uh, uh, Justice Potter Stewart in, um, in a very interesting, this is Jacobellis versus Ohio. So in, in 1958, uh, Louis Mal made a movie called, uh, in English, The Lovers, Les Amants, who won a, a prize in Venice that year. And uh, it was released in 1959 in the United States. And, in the beautiful state of Ohio, they decided it was pornography. It went to the Supreme Court of the United States and um, this, the concurrence from, from Justice Stewart ended the case in favor of Jacobellis, who was the exploitant of the movie theater in Ohio in Cleveland, uh, who has projected the film. It has changed forever the definition of pornography in, uh, in North America and this is why you have all been able to read and, re and re read Henry Miller in English original edition rather than the French cheap paperback uh, that your parents were using. My parents, at least, <laughs> were using. So um, the, the, the interesting point here is, is not Jacobellis versus Ohio, but this, this notion that sometimes you know things that you cannot describe or define. I know when I see it. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's true about um, policy. Although, in fact, um, I something think I know when it is not policy and I know more easily when something is presented to me uh, when it is not policy rather than when it is policy. And I, I think it's part of understanding policies, understanding the differences between policy and advocacy, policy and ideology or doctrine, policy and, and, and decision, and uh, of course, policy and, uh, and analysis. 
it, it's different from, from advocacy for, for a reason to have mentioned at, at, at the beginning. It, it's strange because advocacy and policy looks much alike. Good advocacy is supposed to be based on evidence, like policy. It, 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 it is supposed to, to, to be based on reason and, 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 uh, and, and to be oriented towards solutions and so on and so forth. But in the end, those are very different continent. Why? In part because the temporality of policy is always very different from the temporality of, of advocacy. Advocacy is preoccupied by the past. Advocacy is certainly preoccupied by the future. Policy is always centered on the present, on what can be done now. And I will try to explain that further um, later. Advocacy is preoccupied by very often, and I have dealt with advocates many times in my career, it, it's preoccupied by an ideal allocation of resources. When you're dealing with policy, you're telling yourself, okay, what can we do now with what we have? And it's, all, again, a very different kind of interpretation and vision of, of reality. Policy is, is different from, from ideology and doctrine in, in large part because at, at, the, at the heart of policy, there is always this reasoning that we're, we're preoccupied by if there is a problem and we apply this solution, we will have this result, which is a very simple kind of rational reasoning that is very different from the one cure uh, uh, fits all that you will find in politics and, and ideology. It's more difficult sometimes to understand, it's more less intuitive to understand the difference between complexity, between decision and, and policy. It is based on, and, and some of my friends call that PG's first law of organization. You know, the more policy you have, the less decision you have to make. When you wake up in the morning, if you have good policies, you don't have to decide every morning on what side of the road you will drive. You don't have to decide if you can smoke or not in a public um, 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 setting. The, the policy are, are there to simplify the number of decisions, to reduce the number, to structure your choice. And this is part of the, the difference between something that is always unique and tragic and should be redo and done and redone again, and the difference with with, with uh, policies that are precisely there to simplify um, this, this situation. So in organization, the more policy you have, the less decisions you will have to make. And um, it's, it's complex eh, because the, very often in organization, this is just a, a digression, but in, in organization very often, the people that are making, that are called policy makers are making decisions, and the people that are making decisions are, are actually uh, designing the policy, and, and this is like parkway driveway, driveway in English, you know the, the problem. So uh, it's so very often the, the difficulty to understand exactly what, what people are, are actually doing in, in organization. And finally, there is a difference with, with analysis per se in, in large part because of causality. And for this, I, I thought it would be interesting for you to see, this is a very famous uh, uh, graph, it comes from what has been the, 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 the most important textbook of the 1980s, uh, Good and, and Gun, uh, Policy Analysis for the Real World. And it, it's an, an, a presentation of, of, of uh, the different causes and reasons behind a, a, a simple problem. In that case, uh, Vandal hacked, for instance, uh, breaking the glasses in the bus, bus shelter. And if you look at this, I will move, I'm sorry, I will move just This is the broken windows theory that has been applied massively, as you know, in New York. Um, this is the community policing theory. The idea that if we put pol policemen on the beat, um, it will actually change something to the prevalence of, of, uh, of vandal acts. This is what our friends at Soros are doing, in particular this. Um, trying to act at this level on, on those small acts of, of uh, vandalism. And then you have the favorite theory of people on the right side of the spectrum uh, about heredity and criminal personality and, and, uh, and so forth. And 
the, the, the thing with policy analysis, and it, for me it was not a surprise that policy action took place mostly at the level of group seven and group eight in that, because it is about what can be done now. It is about uh, what uh, can be done with the, 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 the means that we, that we have at, at a given point, rather than necessarily looking at the deeper, longer term um, causes. In fact, you know, at, at, I'm sure you all know the, the cliche about teaching people to fish, but I could tell you if you tell your, your political masters that um, you want to teach people to fish, they will ask you, do you know an expeditious and very effective manner to do so? Because if you don't, I need to know exactly how many fish needs to be distributed tomorrow. And this is the difference, again, between the causality of analysis and the causality in policy. That is always looking for the remedies rather than the solution. It doesn't mean that you're not interested in solutions. It doesn't mean that you will not invest in long-term solution. But you still have a duty, and your attention is focused on the immediate remedies that you could bring um, to a problem. So what is policy? Well, the answer from that Vincent Lemieux that I mentioned at the very beginning has, has brought forward in his work and that has become so influential is this very powerful intuition that policy is essentially information, but not information in the common sense of the term, but the, the technical term as the, this, this notion has been introduced in fact by, by, uh, by Wiener in, in, uh, in 1950, like in, in cybernetics when he started making the difference between control and communication. Bateson in the 1960s imposed the, 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 the difference between statement and command. Instead, it's, those are the same con concept, but the vocabulary has been stabilized after uh, Bateson paper of, uh, of 1968. And this is the, the, the very central quote in, in this text. It is evident that every message uh, has two sorts of meaning. On the one hand, the message is a statement, or report about events at a previous moment, and on the other hand, it is a command, a cause, uh, or a stimulus for events at a later moment. And all my students, they could, there are a few here, they could bear witness that they know the difference between statement and command. It has all sort of important consequences in, in analysis. And again, think that what we're trying to do, which is not very different to what was taking place during this second cognitive turn is understand the heuristics, understand how the, the mind of a policymaker uh, works. So the first thing is that if policy is information, it could be described, it could be uh, described as a narrative. And it has all sorts of important consequences. First, uh, it means that at, at, in the simplest form, a policy is always a statement of the type we have problem P, we will apply remedy R, and we will have solution S. And the capacity to take any form of policy and transpose it into that very simple vocabulary is for me one of the first and most important skills that we try to develop in students in, in public policy. The capacity to actually translate any po policy, whatever its complexity, in those narratives. The other important um, characteristic of, of of policy as a narrative is that if it is a narrative, it could be translated. It could be translated for different audiences. It could be a 10 second clip that the politician will use on the evening news, or it could be a 160 page um, report uh, for expert. But this capacity, because it's a narrative, to translate it and to adapt it to different, without changing profoundly the meaning of, of it. Um, all policies will so say, state something about the problem they aim to address, and all policies will prescribe a specific behavior uh, to an agent or a class of agent, being a group, a, a group of individuals or, or a nation. And as I said here, if you don't have those, those two elements present, you don't have a policy. You have something else. Uh, which is a problem statement. You have something else, which is a set of instruction, but you don't have this, this arc of meaning that the policy mind is looking for. 
So let's go through the, the, the characteristics of uh, policy when you describe it as, uh, as information. So the first thing is, is policy statements. All policies start by saying what the problem is. And they, they do that first by providing a description. Very often, it, it, and, and again, I'm, I'm so used to see that now, and I'm sure you will be so used at some point to see that. You will recognize the facts and the, 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 the sort of causal mechanism around those facts that are suggested in the description. This is the problem. The problem is that we see an increase in the temperature of the atmosphere on, on this planet. And the causal mechanism, what is the causal mechanism? It is man-made or not? And this is exactly what the statement will do. And it means that it will be contestable. It is not evidence. It is eminently contestable because there is a selection of facts and there's also a choice on the type of causal mechanism that will be applied to these facts. There will be an evaluation inside this. This is an important problem or not. And you, you could be sure that the stakeholder groups will fight politically to impose the urgency or not of a given problem, saying this is something that needs the immediate attention of the nation or not. This is not a problem. This is something that could wait. We agree, but let's, ta let's, let's wait. We will see. It will also include an orientation about what to do, not necessarily in terms of prescripting a discrete action, but in terms of this problem um, could be better treated by letting the market taking care of it. And this is an orientation. And very evidently, all this being constantly revisited in um, the, the, the process of the policy being developed and, and debated in society. Um, one of the fascinating things, you know, the, the Norman Wiener books was called the human use of human beings, the fascinating phenomenon that we could actually have people do things that they don't want to do, like giving lectures um, on, a, on a late afternoon. So um, policies are fantastic. You create a policy that people that are promoted must give a lecture and they don't have a choice. You see my point now, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, the, the, the way we, we do things with policy, first, um, we, I think the first question, is, especially in public institution, you ask yourself is, what, what does, what, what proportion, what use of coercion I will include in my reaction and then my prescription? Because there is also always this possibility in public institution that you will be able to use coercion so that you could actually force people to do things. You could tell them that you will have issues with your chair if you don't show up for your lecture. This is called coercion. You, know that. Um, you could use a large variety of means, and I will come back to this idea, to actually uh, achieve the, the, the goals and the aims that of, of the policy. Um, we have demonstrated, there, there has been a lot of work on, on, this, this, uh, on this issue and this is the only case where I, I, I will refer, refer really to a, a research paper here. But uh, this is a, a work I did, and the details are not important, this is work I did a few years ago on, on policy frames in health reform. And the, the only point, I will move again, the only point I want to make here is this idea that you have discrete frames of reference. Here they have been called organizational, pluralist, cognitive, structural. And for each of those frames, the frames will prescribe um, what is the focus of your policy? Uh, what kind of incentives will you, will you be using? Uh, what kind of resources are mobilizable? And if you choose one frame over the other, you will not pay the same attention to the other dimension. If you're extremely preoccupied, this is trendy at this moment, by the culture of health. Your attention to the behavior, the rational behavior of actors in the organization will decrease. The, the, the border between the frames are never completely neat and clear, but still it's, it's fascinating when you start looking at proposals that are available on, on, 
on, on the, this, this big market of ideas that, that, that is health reform, how well they are located and locked into different uh, policy frames. So the point here is that the command portion of, of a policy will be very often driven by those frames because they, they give indication on what tools can you use, what are the targets, and uh, what are the targets also in terms of the human beings that um, you're expecting uh, will behave uh, differently. Another aspect of this, I, and I allude to that, um, it's this, it, it's probably one of the, the less intuitive part of, um, of policy analysis at this point. It comes from the public choice literature and it is this idea that when I, when I talk with my students, especially students that come from public health, when you say policy, they hear government. You say policy and they hear government. It's, you say it's not exactly the same letters. You see, I say policy. They say government. No. And what you have to get them to, to grasp is that policy is not only about government. Policy is also about using markets to use your to achieve your objectives. Policy is also about using um, altruism to achieve your objective. Policy is also about using cooperation, and sometimes it is about using conflict. Um, the, the canonical example for this distribution is uh, housing. And in, in housing, um, for, of course, you will have always a portion of people that will actually, in a pluralistic democratic society, um, buy houses, condos, apartments, and so on. The market will take care of part of them. Uh, you have people that are hosted for free, that are housed for free. You say, impossible. No, that's not true. A lot of students live with their parents, and I, I never charge a rent to my daughters. Um, they are housed for free. And society is expecting that, that you will take, they are expecting more and more that you will take care of uh, your elderly parents for free, again. Um, you could solve the problem with cooperation. There are many cooperative solutions for, for, uh, for housing. There are um, solutions, of course, of public housing and government. And on the fringe, in most society, we tolerate some form of, we tolerate squatting. We have, all, even in this country, encouraged squatting at a certain period of our history, which is typically using conflict as a, as a solution for, for housing. So I could, we, we don't have the time, but we, you could apply this reasoning to all sorts of other, um, other objects. So what is policy? Policy is a message about the message. Policy is the moment where you, you say, okay, let's play chess. This is Bateson's favorite example. Let's play chess is not playing chess. It's a message about the message. Or a message about the message could be there will be no public option. This is a message about the message. This is a message at the moment where you say that the policy mix that will come, the policy mix will include a certain number of instruments but not others. And that the proportion between those instruments will vary. It will vary in time because some things will work and some things will not. At some point you will decide that care that is provided for free is not working anymore and that you need to have other form of support for this. At some point, you will have decided that there is a variation that is acceptable in the performance of each of these instruments, at which point you will say, well, maybe we should use something else. And flexibility is the real answer to complexity. Bad policy, complex solutions to complex problems. Good policies, complex problems, flexibility on the other hand. And there is a, a we don't teach that yet, yet, but a very important development in policy analysis now is called policy design, and it is based on the idea that the people that are the better equipped to discuss those variations between instruments are the public, are the citizens themselves, and that by incorporating citizens' point of view in the design of policy, we will actually have a better, much better sense of where are the points of the range of variation in the tools that are um, used. So, a few, a few, the week before Christmas, actually, I was in uh, Los Angeles, and one night we found ourselves 
but a surprise in a traffic jam on a highway between Santa Monica and uh, West Hollywood, and we were late for, we were there for a while. And I suggested the people in the car that we should play the policy game. The policy game is a game in which you discuss the different elements of a problem without, in the first place, even, even mentioning a solution. Try it, you will see it's incredibly difficult. When people are caught in a pub traffic uh, jam, they start very evidently and very fast to say there should be more people in the cars. I say, no, this is a solution. Um, they want more lanes on the highway or they want public transit or etc. And you see, that, that's solutions. Just try to discuss the problem itself. It's very interesting because after a while, beginning, they don't like you very much, but uh, <laughs> after a while, they start discussing things like oil prices and public transit, and culture, and work hours, things that were not evident at the beginning of the conversation. And I think this is the first blooming of a policy mind. It's this moment where you start seeing a problem in its full complexity, when you don't jump immediately on a uh, solution. The policy game is problem-centered. The policy mind looks at the problem first. And not only that, it is based on collective understanding. What makes it rich is not the fact that I have, I have started thinking it all alone in my car to the solution, the traffic jam. What has made it rich is the fact that we were a group of people discussing and debating different aspects of, um, of the problems. There is no superhero in policy. It is always a collective pro pro process. It is always a team process. It is always a collective intellectual working and trying to achieve an understanding of, uh, of the issue. Um, the other thing you discover, and this is the second blooming of the policy mind, is that you have to apply pressing and expedient remedy. In that case, leave the highway and accept to go in the maze of street and boulevards of West Hollywood if you will, want ever to go to the meeting. Um, the solutions of putting a toll or changing oil prices or create incentives or build, they are all long-term. They are all, it, they are important. It is important to address those complex and subtle solutions, but you cannot do it now. You have always, and I think I have insisted on this since the beginning, to introduce pressing and expedient remedies to the solution. This is what makes the difference between policy and something else. The quote at the end is a, is a quote by, by the French author Paul Valéry. It's the last line of uh, a book called The Fixed Idea. Um, it's a dialogue you, you could find in French. The, the, there is a play um, that has been made of the, the, the book, made of the book, and so you could find it on, on YouTube easily. But the, this last line is very important, this idea, and in French there is a play on the sense because it, it could be translated also, and I think it makes a lot of sense, when lonely a man is never in good company. But so it, it's, it's this idea that all that I have described doesn't take place in a physical mind. A policy mind is always something that is collective, that is done by teams, by people, um, working together. Um, yeah, at some point you have to give way to politics and I have experienced that in organization, I have experienced that with colleagues. In fact, my very first debate, as I, so my, my first appointment was with the medical school at University of Montreal a long time ago and um, I was called to give to debate with a very eminent colleague um, who was there to argue that if the government have followed his advice and created the system of primary care he has recommended, the system will work so much better. And I was there to argue that, in fact, politics has produced a better system. It was not the perfect system he had on paper, but it was a system that patients and doctors were ready to support. And I think it's clear, we, we resent the sloppiness of politics. Everybody in policy will always think of politics as the end of policy, but it is not. Politics is the continuation of policy by other means. Uh, policy, politics is, if you really believe that government is not there to do everything, if you believe that in a pluralistic complex society, you need to have this, this, this bundle of policy tools that you will use that will, that, that, that will use the market and the government and the, 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 
spontaneous help that people are, are ready to provide to each other. You need the political system to support that. You couldn't, ha you couldn't have, for instance, selective um, uh, collection of waste in a city if citizens are not doing their part. Again, do you want to have inspector in every house to look if they are actually separating the paper from, no, you, you can't. You need a political system that people trust so that they will accept uh, that the policy could actually be uh, implemented. So I, I, I believe, it, yeah, there is frustration when you are engaged in policy and, and you see your, 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 your creations, your, your hard work destroy uh, and because they are going to just a few elements of it. But it is an essential uh, way of actually prolonging and, and making policy um, happening. And my, my conclusion, so we are a school of public health and uh, it's, it's very clear we need to train advocates. Um, we, we need to train people that will campaign for the adoption of evidence-based solution. We, we need to train analysts because we, we need to train people that will invest their life and the, 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 their, their best brains into the understanding of the deeper causes of, of uh, the issues. I am not opposed, you see how the way it is phrased, eh? I am not opposed to welcoming politicians and decision makers. Um, uh, it, it's clear, without their efforts, there will be no way. Um, we, we, we will always stay, as I put here, disconnected from, from uh, from, for, from, real, uh, from the real needs of the world. But I, I plead that we put ourselves at, at the developing policy mind as well. I need company. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. Thank you, Pierre. So you left. Um, <laughs> so I don't know about you. So there's some students in this class or from, from your class, but I, I did not expect a, uh, a talk on policy to start out with cybernetics. And, um, and uh, is, that, is that routine in the policy world that people apply that framework of, of you know, uh, communication and control? And it's routine in my class. In your class, yeah, it's yeah. pretty amazing. Okay, so, uh, and I also, I was on the I-10 uh, on Sunday in, in that exact traffic jam. So <laughs> I put you the know what to do now. I put the radio on. No. Uh, okay. so, uh, so please, comments, questions? Al? So in the real world, as, as you know better probably than I do, um, we have our group of... This is Vicente. I recognize her. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you want to talk, Vicente? I don't do that. <laughs> Um, so we have, you know, people here who are deeply invested in coming up with an evidence-based, rational approach to solving a problem. And then you smack into the real world where there are politicians who actually have all the things that you, you know, listed beforehand. They have a, an unevidence-based point of view. They have, um, you know, the way they want to go about doing things. So how do you start? From a practical perspective, you've got your data, you've got your reasoning, rational reasoning, and then you've got people who have their belief system, which gets challenged by this. How do you, how do you begin to have a dialogue with them? Yeah, it's a, there are many questions embedded in your questions. The first one is that policy work never start as you just described. Policy work starts with a problem. And, and, and so what you do is that your first thing is trying to, and, and especially if you are in, a, in an environment in which there, there, there is a, a strong and important policy capacity, which is a problem in many public institutions nowadays, you will start actually looking at the problem and deconstructing the problem. And you will look at people that have evidence for that. But you're, you're talking from the point of view of the people that have produced the evidence. How I get the attention of, uh, there is no miracle there. The, the only thing I know is that you need people that will do, this is what I was hired to do when I was in government, to bridge the word of evidence and the word of, of policy. So you need to make sure that you're training well the people in policy. I argue, you know, and for, for that all the time, we should bring more people from the policy world into our programs so that they get, you, you will be surprised sometimes. I, um, I was 
a few months in, in my job when I came to uh, Health Canada, and I received a, an email late at night, uh, you know, on my BlackBerry from, uh, from a very close member of the minister's office, PG, would you know somebody in, you, that has worked already on the idea that other people, that doctors could provide primary care? This was a department where probably 600 people could have answered that question. There was probably tons of evidence available, but there was a, a Chinese wall between the people that are actually making the decisions and people developing the policy. And there, so no miracle, but you, you can break and this, this wall or chip at it you know, by, by making sure that the more people will be aware of the existence of our work. I have argued also for the, the importance of letting journalists come um, and embedded journalists into our world because they are translator. The, the, my argument about the narrative, my argument that a narrative could be translated, the, the, the professional translators are the journalists, especially political journalists. They are incredibly good at doing that. It's frustrating for us because they simplify, they, they don't write your names right, um, etc. But in the end, they get the idea true. So we've been thinking a lot about advocacy at the school, and as you know, some faculty have proposed an advocacy institute. So, so your your sense of the difference, uh, if I understood it, the difference between policy and advocacy is that advocacy tries to bring new resources to a problem where where policy looks at what we have now and resources and how do we solve it. Is that? Is it that is certainly one of the two dimensions. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The other is clearly that uh, I I. I most of the, the work that has come to me with the label advocacy was looking, you know, people try to fix the past. Uh -huh. And this is something that it's very difficult to fix the past with a policy. Mm -hmm. I, I, I could fix the consequences in the present. Mm -hmm. And if I'm very clever, which is not often the case, I, I could do something for the future. But I will essentially try to concentrate on the on the present. Mm -hmm. And and, and it, it's not a judgment on advocacy. It's this is a different endeavor. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, in the back, Josh, uh, Becky, could you give Josh the... So we need to use the microphone so it's picked up on the recording. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my question is, um, you speak of uh, policy, people in policy as if it's a profession as opposed to a skill. Can you hear me? That the distinction between policy as a profession as opposed to a skill. The people who do policy are different from advocates as opposed to advocates could be more effective if they learn the skills of policy. Is, am I misunderstanding yeah, that? So or is it a field or is it a, is it a Yeah, there's method? probably no need, to, you know, I was not a professional policy maker. I was an academic when I was you know, first brought into that world. So is it a profession? Certainly not. I'm, after all, you know, I'm, a, I'm an imposter. I'm, I'm an historian of science. You know, uh, this is the only thing I really know. But I came there, and as I said, because it's not you, you're thinking in terms of individual, I think in terms of collective. It's because I, I, I became part of that group of people that slowly my perception and my reaction to public problems changed. And so, is it a profession? No. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a situation. It's a it's a situation in in the way we we uh, we govern uh, our societies. And uh, during the time you're there, you it, you you will see slowly your the way your brains work change. Is it? I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying it's distinct, different, and it 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 provides probably for um, I believe. Um, important solutions for solving the problems of, of our society. So um, I want to thank you for, for uh, a great talk. And uh, I'm a little embarrassed because we're having a reception. I don't know where the wines are from. But I, but I hope uh, that uh, everybody will join us and continue conversation. The worst can be sometimes from Canada, but it's another story. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, Pierre.